Let's uh, open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 9, and we'll begin looking at this after a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time together this morning, and thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together. Lord, we are living in interesting times, and we pray that you would help us to begin to understand some of what is happening around us. And as Dave reminded us Wednesday evening, our our world is not, as so many people have said, our world is not falling apart. Uh, Things are becoming less settled. Things are becoming more concerning. And we're seeing people's attitudes and uh, character change. Lord, help us to maintain a character of godliness and uh, absolute trust in you in these unsettling times. And we know that as we will look at the text of Revelation, that things are going to get far, far, far worse uh, in the coming days and weeks and months especially during the time of the tribulation. And we pray that you would help us to just rest in you. We know that you're in control and that you are sovereign over all. We commit to you this time this morning. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone asked me last week about this, uh, what I did I, uh, I went from Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapters 8 and 9. And someone asked me, did I miss something? Because Revelation chapter 7 is in there too. And no, I said, you didn't miss anything. I did that on purpose. Uh, what I see, and I'll, I'll explain it here in a minute, but what I see as occurring sequentially through Revelation are these three series of judgments. You had the seal judgments in Revelation chapter 6, and then you have the trumpet judgments following the seal judgments in chapters 8 and 9, and then you have the bowl judgments that come along in chapter 16. And I, and I see those things occurring sequentially or chronologically. That, In other words, The first seal judgment takes us from the very beginning of the tribulation, and the last vile judgment takes us up to the second coming of Christ, uh, the Battle of Armageddon or the Campaign of Armageddon and, and all of that, and we'll see that here in a bit. The other thing... I want to mention is, uh, well, so, so where does chapter 7 fit in? Why, why did I say chapter 6 goes to chapters 8 and 9? I see chapter 7 as being supplemental information. Remember, in chapter 6, it ends with a vast multitude of people who have died. In, in other words, one-fourth of the earth's population has, has been destroyed in, in the seal judgments. More follow in the, in the uh, trumpet and bowl judgments. But the, the fact is, it's not all doom and gloom. And I think chapter 7 is there to provide encouragement that despite how bad it's going to be, God, number one, God is still going to have His witnesses. 144,000 Jewish believers, Jewish male believers, will serve God. They will be sealed, and we'll talk about this. They will be sealed with the seal of God. They will be protected throughout that period of time. Well, how successful will their ministry be? Well, the last part of chapter 7 answers that. Because John is asked the question, remember, by one of the uh, elders... Who are these? Who is this great multitude? What what are they? And John says, "My Lord, you know." And 
the, the, uh, the elder says, well, these are they which come out of tribulation, the great one. And they've washed their robes in, in white and, and all of that. So I see chapter 7 as supplemental to chapter 6. Chapters, so that takes us to chapters 8 and 9, and, and we looked at that last week a little bit. Um, all right, here we go. Chapters 8 and 9 talk about the seven trumpet judgments, the seven the seventh seal opens up into the seven trumpets, and the seven trumpets begin to sound. And we looked at this last week, and we got through the first, I believe we got through the first five trumpet judgments, didn't we? We, we talked about these, and in the fifth trumpet judgment, and this is where I want to pick it up this morning at the beginning of chapter 9. In the fifth trumpet judgment, John says, the fifth, tr- the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Now, when, when the Bible uses the word star, symbolically, it's talking about an angel. It's talking about not, not one of the heavenly bodies like the sun, moon, and stars. It's talking about an angel. How do we know that it's talking about an angel? Well, keep reading. He falls from heaven, and it says, to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. You see that personal pronoun, to him. It's talking about a personal being. It's talking about an entity. And it says, he opened the bottomless pit. Folks, That is a horrible, horrible place. We thank God right now in this dispensation that that pit is not open. Because there are demonic beings that occupy that place right now. Remember in the life of Jesus, when uh, Jesus goes to and he sees this, uh, he sees this demon-possessed man, and he, he casts out the demon because and it turns out the guy says, "My name is Legion, for we are many." And he pleads with Jesus not to send him into the bottomless pit, the abyss. Jesus says, "Okay, you can go into the swine." And the swine run off the cliff. This bottomless pit, is the, the residency or the abode of horrible, horrible demonic beings. It will be opened. And it says in verse 2, there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. You know, y- yesterday uh, we had... Uh, Josh and Tiff and, and Declan and Jeanette and I went up to uh, Shaver Lake. And I haven't been up there, you know, for several years. I, I could not believe the devastation that's up there. The, the burned over area was just stunning to me. I took a, I took a couple of pictures you just can't get over the the magnitude of that of that fire and i and i remember the smoke from those fires you know and you, you'd be down here in the valley and that fire the smoke would just burn your eyes imagine this this scene that john sees there's a smoke that arises out of this bottomless pit but that's not the worst part of it the worst comes out now. The sun, he says, the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, verse 3 tells us the, the horrible part of this. It's not just the smoke. Locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as scorpions of the earth have power. And a lot of people this week, a lot of people have come to me just stunned that I've never seen a scorpion in person. I mean, they're just stunned. 
I've never seen one. I've seen, I've seen them on TV. I've seen, and believe me, people have showed me pictures this week of scorpions. So thank you. And uh, Mrs. Dougherty was kind enough to show me a picture of a black mamba. Not a scorpion. A serpent. And the, but it was dead. And those kinds of pictures I like to see. Dead black mambas. But anyway, it was commanded them that they should hurt not the grass, which is unusual because remember, what do locusts like to munch? Vegetation. But these locusts, he's, you're forbidden from that. Neither green, any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God on their, in their foreheads. And I, and I take this to refer back to chapter 7. In other words, these locusts, these demons are not allowed to hurt the 144,000. They're restricted. They're prohibited. They can only do so much to a certain group. To them was given not to kill, verse 5, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now, they can't kill anybody, but they can put, uh, cause pain and affliction on people. For how long? Five months. That's like, remember what we talked about? It's like from the month of January, clear through March, January, February, March, April, May. For five months, these, these human beings will endure, endure this affliction. And in those days, he says in verse 6, how bad could it really be? Men will seek death and shall not find it. I read several commentaries this week on this because I wanted to you know, really see. Can, can you really take that literally? Men will seek death and not find it. I mean, they'll try to commit suicide and they won't be able to do it. Think about that. It'll be so bad, I want to kill myself. It'll be so bad, I want to die. I just want my life to be over. This hurts so much. Can you take it literally? I love this, I love this quote by David L. Cooper. The golden rule of interpretation. If you don't know this, you need to know this. This, this is such an important rule of interpretation of Scripture. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context studied in light of related passages and axiomatic, that is self-evident, unquestionable, and fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. When the Bible says... Five months. How long will these, will these locusts inflict men? Six months? Six years? Six days? Five months. When the Bible says that men will not be able to kill themselves, does it really mean that? Yes. It means that. It will be so bad they will seek death and they will not be able to die. And then he goes on in verse 7 and, and describes the shape of these locusts or the shape of these demonic beings. Uh, their, their heads, uh, the shapes of locusts were like horses prepared unto battle. On their heads were crowns like gold. Their faces are faces of men. That means they have intelligence. The, these demons have intel Are demons intelligent? Do demons have intelligence? They don't have, I don't think they have wisdom. I think they have intelligence. They're very smart. They're very cunning. The shapes of the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. Their, their, ha their hair is the hair of women. Their teeth, the teeth of lions. They had breastplates. As it were, breastplates of iron, sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. 
tails like they had tails like scorpions. That, w that and their ruler is a badon, which in, in the Greek is uh, Apollyon. A badon is Hebrew, Greek is Apollyon, and, and that tells us that these men will afflict Jews and Gentiles. They'll go after all mankind who are not sealed with the seal of God. Now, that's the first woe. Remember back in uh, earlier, he had said that there were three woes to follow. And what did we say that the woes were about? The woes were indicative of a calamity or a catastrophic thing that's coming on the earth. Uh, I, we talked about this in Isaiah chapter 5. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet. In that section of Isaiah, there are different woes that Isaiah is giving. And Isaiah is speaking about some calamity that's coming on the earth. Well, that's bad. One woe is past. Behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And this is where we'll pick it up this morning and hopefully finish this. The sixth angel sounded, verse 13. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which, are pre which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and with them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three, the third part of men killed by fire and by smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth, and in their tails there were tails like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. I think what he's describing here is another demonic invasion. He says in verse, in verse 13 that this voice is coming from the four horns of the golden altar. And remember, you go back into chapter 4, and you go back to chapter 5, and you see that vision of the golden altar that, that, and the throne, the throne room of God. And this voice issues forth to this sixth angel to loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And, and this passage is, been, has, is absolutely fascinating, but it is absolutely frustrating because so many people today take this and misinterpret what is going to happen. They, they combine this passage with one over in Revelation chapter 16. When the kings of the earth, or the, sorry, the kings of the east invade the Middle East. These two judgments are two different judgments. They occur at two different times. They involve two different entities. Notice, notice what it says about this. These, these leaders are bound in the river Euphrates. When you see the river Euphrates, 
when you see references to the river Euphrates, you have to realize it is a specific location. And there was a massive city that was built, and a very important city that was built on the river Euphrates. Can you guess what it was? Can you guess what it will be in the future? Babylon. There is only one city in all of Scripture that is named, that is mentioned more than Babylon. Babylon and Jerusalem. Jerusalem comes first. Babylon is mentioned second. And Babylon, or, or the Euphrates region, was often designated as a place of demonic influence, demonic source. These entities, these leaders, these angels are bound in a place that is sourced in demonism. They're bound in the river Euphrates. And verse 15 tells us that they were there, or they are there, prepared specifically for this reason, or this time, I should say, for an hour and a day and a month and a year. In other words, they are, they are there, as God says, they are there for this specific time. Time. They will be released at this specific time. They're not being released now. Notice what he says. Here's the reason to slay the third part of men. Remember what I said when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense? Does the Bible really mean it to say that a third of, of the human population will die in this judgment? Think about that, because earlier, back in uh, the seal judgments, I'm going to see if I can find it in chapter 6, the seal judgments, we were told uh, with the, uh, I believe it's with the fourth seal, uh, I looked in verse 8, behold, a pale horse, his name was hell and death, or death and hell. The power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, with pain, and with beasts of the earth. One fourth of, of the human race will be killed in the fourth uh, seal judgment. Now, in this sixth trumpet judgment, one third of the population. Let's, let's say, for example, that when the tribulation begins, the earth's population is roughly seven billion people. By the time you get to this judgment, over one half of the population of, hum of the human race will be killed. 3.5 billion people, or we should say this, 3.5 billion souls will be destroyed, will be killed. That's that is a staggering number when you, when you stop and think. This, isn't, this is three and a half years. In World War II, World War II ran from, I, I'm going to say it was early 1930s on to uh, uh, 1945, because I'm going to say the, the, the invasion of China started the war and, and you had it going on, and then it, it expands to all over the world. How many people were killed during that 12, 13, 14 years? About 60, 70 billion, or, or sorry, 60 million people were killed. This, this, in this brief period of time, a staggering number of people are going to be killed. And, and it goes on and says, the number of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. I am terrible at math. I, I have told you this before. I was, I was really good at math until we got into addition and subtraction and multiplication. <laughs> Division was disastrous for me. I could count to 10. 
It can even count to 12. Two, what he's saying here is this is an army of 200 million. And, and people often, often will take this and say, well, this is referring to the, the Chinese. The Chinese have 200 million soldiers. Well, wait a minute. How do we know they actually have that number? But notice, notice the description of this army. It says... He saw the horses and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, fire and brimstone. And their heads were like the horses, excuse me, the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. That's describing another demonic invasion. He's describing the, these horrible, horrible creatures that, remember, they are led by demons out of the Euphrates River. And by these was the third part of men killed by fire and the smoke and by the brimstone, which, which issued out of their mouths. For their power was in their mouth and their tails. And their tails were like unto serpents. And with them they do hurt. Remember the first woe? It, it was bad because man was inflicted. Man was inflicted with pain. And, and the pain went on for five months. But it says they could not kill. Now... Now, these demons are allowed to kill. So you know what that makes this, the second woe? Worse than the first. Worse than the first. So you're going from bad to worse. You're going from bad to horrible. But I want you to notice, and I'm gonna, I want to spend a little more time here with this. Well, their power was in their tail. Do you, do you know, verse 19, I, sh I should back this up a little bit. Do you, well, I'm just going to mention it. Do you know Joel chapter 1? Joel chapter 1 and Joel chapter 2 talk about this demonic invasion as well. And, and it gives a little bit different perspective of it. You would think, you would think that at this point, mankind realizes this is, this is divine judgment. This is divine, not chastening, this is divine punishment on our rebellion. But I want you to notice what John says about the reaction of man. You know, Matt's been talking on Sunday mornings about uh, the, the Exodus, and, it, and it's always struck me it's always struck me as fascinating how Pharaoh's heart was hardened by Pharaoh himself and by God. And you would think that, you know, the first four plagues or so might start him thinking, uh, maybe there's something to this Yahweh. Maybe there's something to this God of Israel that I need to, you know, back up here and maybe I, I should think about this a little bit. But he doesn't. He doesn't. And guess what? I don't think he's unusual. I think most people feel that same way. Most people look at what happens in life, not, not as divine judgment, but just something that happens. And verse 20, verses 20 and 21 are, are stunning to me, because, but yet they're not. The rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, all the trumpet judgments that, that have come, all the seal judgments that have come along, which were not killed by these plagues, these next three words, yet repented not. 
yet repented not. I mean, all of this that they've seen, all of this experience, they've lost family, they've lost friends, they've lost everything. They repent not. They don't change their mind. They, they, their hearts are hardened. It says they've repented not of their works. I mean, you can, just, you can just see them shaking their fist at God. And saying, similarly to what the Jews did when Christ was on trial, we will not have this man rule over us. His blood be on us and on our children. They repented not of their works, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. I mean, you're talking about just idolatry, and you're talking about uh, pagan idolatry, and it's it's manifest in, in many different ways, in many different forms. And all of these idols are lifeless. They can't do anything. They can't hear. They can't see. They can't walk. They can't talk. They, they do nothing. So they repent not of their works, of their hands, the, the idols that they've created. But watch this in verse 21 and ponder this. Neither repented they of their murders. I, I think this is telling because I'm seeing our world get more and more violent and tolerating more and more uh, not just wickedness but evil and taking of human life, the wanton taking of human life. Human life means nothing. It's not, I'm, not just talking about, I'm not just talking about the abortion industry. And it is an industry. It's, it's big money. But end of life. And, all thing, and everything in between. It means, it means nothing to people. To, to commit acts of violence and, and wanton acts of, of murder. Now watch this next one. This one is interesting. Nor of their, they don't repent of their murders, nor of their, watch this, sorceries. That's, that is an interesting word, sorceries. It's the word pharmakia. We get our word pharmacy from this word. What's pharmacy? It's drugs. We have pills for everything today. I mean, you, you could buy a pill to calm you down. You could buy a pill to relax your mind. You, you could buy pills. I mean, they just, the industry just inundates us with, they, with medicines for this, that, and the other thing. But he goes on and says, nor of their fornication, nor of their sexual license, their, their attitude toward uh, perversion. I, I'm so glad that our, our culture isn't perverted. <laughs> and, and obviously I'm being facetious, but it's just, it's not stunning, but it's disturbing to see things normalized on TV, on radio, on billboards, in magazines, to see things normalized that are not normal. They are just, there, there is not just a, an openness uh, about talking about it, there is an openness about 
promoting it. And if you read, but if you read Romans chapter 1 carefully, you'll see this is, this is the way societies go, cultures go, when they leave God out of the equation or when they drive Him out of the equation. Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. And they change the glory of the incorruptible God into a, a, a corruptible creature. And they worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator. And, and if you go to Romans chapter 1, I, I, always, I always want to remind us of this. I know th that you know this, but it's so important to recognize this. E each time you see this decline in the culture, in Romans chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Can you think of how absurd that is? I mean, it's just, to us, it's just ridiculous. But, but look at what has happened in our culture. These things are elevated. They're valued. They're treasured more than human life, more than God. In verse 24 then, this is where it really starts. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Change the truth of God for a lie into a lie. They worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Paul sticks that in there as, you know, to, to remind us, God is blessed forever. Verse 26 says, For this cause God gave them up, there it is again, to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat, which was fitting. They did not like to retain God in their heart. Knowledge. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And here it is for the third time. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That, that phrase, a reprobate mind, is, is literally a mind that is incapable of understanding right and wrong, good and evil, light and darkness. It, it, it's a mind that is incapable of making a, a proper judgment, a proper assessment of the situation. You want to know what's happening in our culture? That's Romans chapter 1. And we're not at the first stage where God gave them over. We're not at the second stage where God gave them over. We're clear down at the third stage. And if you, if you look at that, <laughs> I shouldn't have closed that up. If you look at that, what, what happens in verse 31, well, in, yeah, in verse 31, it says, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. I mean, they, they cheer them on. That's exactly what we're seeing in our culture today. They're applauding this. They're promoting this. They're pushing these ideas of perversion, of fornication. 
And then he goes on in the last phrase, back in chapter 9 of Revelation, verse 21, nor of their thefts. I, I remember, what was it, two years ago when, when COVID hit and, and everything shut down and then stores started opening up and you would, you would see these pictures, film of hoods walking, running into stores and grabbing stuff out and just running out of the stores. And you've got people, uh, you know, prosecutors not even prosecuting criminals like that anymore. That's bad, but it's going to get worse. It's going to get much worse. Well, that's my grandson letting me know we're done. <laughs> Grandpa, hurry up. We're, we're finished. Those are the first six trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet doesn't occur over in, until chapter 11. So you have another interlude in here. And I'll tell you, it's going to get worse. These are bad, but it's going to get worse. And I have, I have an outline I'm going to give you, uh, Lord willing, in a, in a week or two. And we'll, we'll see how all of this really fits together, uh, I think, better. But this is, what I'm, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to walk us through the seal, trumpet, and vial judgments to get us from one point to the next. Because the next point, the, the, the next emphasis, I think, is the return of Jesus Christ. His return matters. Because it brings to a conclusion all of this, but it also ushers in a period where none of this, none of this will exist. Because Daniel tells us that all of this is part of the times of the Gentiles. And when that stone, Jesus, comes back, he smashes the image. And all the things that are involved with the times of the Gentiles are driven away like the chaff of the wind, like, like the chaff in the wind. And he'll usher in something completely different. The kingdom of God. The glorious kingdom that this earth yearns for. Creation groans. And so do we. Frankly, so do we. Father, thank you for our time together this morning, and thank you for the opportunity you've afforded us to be here today. Lord, we ask your blessing on this time. May it be an encouragement and a help. May it provide hope and confidence in what lies ahead. Lord, teach us to number our days as, as uh, Moses uh, reminded us. Help us to be faithful in all that you've called us to do, despite all that's going on around us, or, or even because of it. May we trust in you. We commit to you this time now in Jesus' name. Amen.